for sticking it out today. Everybody all right? Everybody good? Okay. Um, they gave me 30 minutes. This is usually a 45-minute talk. I will do my best, um, but I, I want to make sure that this is uh, worth your time. And so, whoops, I'm going to go back. Um, okay, so this is the Expanding Your Empathy talk, and I'm Karanda Adair, and these are some places you can find me on the internet. And um, I just want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me and um, all the previous speakers. I don't think I've ever had a better setup for this talk than <laughs> the speakers that have come before me today. And uh, especially want to thank uh, Caroline for writing a talk that I think was written personally to me, I'm pretty sure, uh, about burnout <laughs> and busyness and overwork. Um, so uh, content warnings for this talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, a lot of the crap that marginalized people put up with every day. So that includes pretty much any ism, any, any ism, any, any phobia, uh, any misogyny, and uh, Nita Sarkeesian's Twitter mentions, um, and police violence against black people, um, and a couple of images, but no dead bodies. Um, so basically, if you've uh, watched the news recently, or God forbid you followed the RNC convention, or you're a marginalized person who uses Twitter, you probably won't see anything super new. <laughs> um, all this has been covered uh, throughout the day. I want to do just a quick um, talk about terms. Um, so derailing, basically uh, not all, like when we're trying to focus on an issue of someone being harmed. Um, derailing by focusing on another issue um, or basically trying to defend your group because you feel under attack, that's no good. Um, tone policing, which is basically like, uh, you know, if you just weren't so angry, like you would have more people on your side. It's, it's focusing on the way a message is delivered rather than the content of the message uh, and the issue that we're trying to talk about. And also there's my obligatory cat slides, those are my boys. Um, <clears throat> and mansplaining, which I think is pretty much summed up here, but you can go and see more examples at mansplain.tumblr.com. <laughs> um, and this conference is called Open Source and Feelings, not Open Source and Facts, so that will be... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that will be reflected in the focus of my talk. I'm not going to be um, citing any scientific um, studies or talking a lot about facts. Um, OK. Oh, and the last thing I want to talk about is uh, Kevin. Um, Kevin is uh, basically an amalgam, a shorthand for talking about sort of the, the default um, most privileged uh, members of society. And Kevin is not any of the following. He's not gay, poor, an immigrant, uh, black, Asian, disabled, uh, unhealthy. He doesn't have to struggle with being different, and he just fits in by virtue of his birth. So when I refer to Kevin, just, you know, that's kind of the overall picture that I want you to have in your head. Uh, and this comes from this amazing article, uh, which you can find on Medium, Seven Leadership Lessons for Minorities and Everyone Else, and I highly encourage you to read it. I'm pretty sure you can find it on my Twitter feed from the last uh, hour. Um, okay, so what are we talking about when we talk about uh, empathy? It's the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. And uh, somebody asked me, or one, one of the other ways I describe it is um, just like, you know, giving a shit about somebody besides yourself. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think you know, every time we try to make progress in society, there's always a lot of pushback. And I think that one of the reasons that um, I'm just going to call him Vol Voldemort uh, is so dangerous, uh, I think you know who I mean, um, is that he basically preaches the opposite of empathy. He preaches apathy. Like, and not only that, but, but like they're proud of it. He gives other people permission to not give a shit about, about anybody else and to, to shout, you know, shout to the world about it. Um, and so uh, someone asked me if I was uh, excited about giving this talk today. And um, that's not one of the feeling words I would have chosen, um, especially if you had asked me a week ago. But one of the things that happened recently is that uh, I had a chance to go to a talk by this woman, Isabel Wilkerson. 
Has anybody know, know of her or, see, or read this book? Okay, I had not heard of her or this book either before, uh, well, a few weeks ago. So I went to this talk two nights ago, um, and she is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, and she wrote this book, The Warmth of Other Suns. And the book is about the Great Migration, which is a period of time, a decades long period of time when almost half the black population of the United States left the South and migrated elsewhere, migrated north and to the West Coast and to the Northwest. Um, and it's one of the most underreported, under, underwritten about like major events of our history. And so she wrote this book and she spent some time on Wednesday speaking about this book. And it was really great timing for me because um, I, was, I was kind of dreading like, I wasn't super excited. Um, and I'll just say, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm going to tell you guys some things that I don't usually say to uh, a large room full of white people. So can I just, can I just tell you some stuff up front? Um, so the last two years have been really, really hard for uh, being a black person in this country. And the last time I gave this talk uh, was about two years ago. And so uh, Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown had recently been murdered. And uh, I wore a, I actually wore a hoodie on stage while I was giving the talk. And I talked about, um, you know, just sort of waking up every day with the knowledge that, you know, I could just be snuffed out for going about my day. Um, and that takes a toll on you. So. Um, these are some of the, the feeling words that <laughs> I would probably use about just, just having lived through, you know, the last little while. And maybe things aren't worse, maybe we just know more about what's happening, but on any given day when I wake up and I, you know, look at social media, there's a better than even chance that I'm going to see a hashtag and that's going to be the name of someone who was killed because they look like me. And that's a, that's a lot to go through every day. So um, I wasn't really, you know, feeling that great. And I've been really feeling like uh, I really don't want to be in spaces where I don't know if it's safe. Um, so if I get invited to, you know, Nicole talked about being invited to the party. So if I decide I want to go to a meetup or a conference or some sort of mainstream majority space, I really have to think hard about Am I, do I want to deal with white people today? I mean, I have to deal with white people every day because I married a white person, but. Um, <laughs> but do I want to go to a space where I don't know who's going to be there and if it's going to be safe, and do I want to deal with that because there's a better than even chance that, you know, somebody's going to, um, that I'm going to experience some kind of microaggression or worse. And so I remember I had had a, a period of time where I, I had been home, you know, alone with the cats for, for a while, and uh, I decided to go to the WordPress meetup. And uh, so this dialogue is going on in my head as I'm making my way down to this WordPress meetup. Like, and you know, the, the one part of me is saying like, oh, stop, stop being so pessimistic. Like, you know, people are basically good, like be open. Um, and so, you know, I went to the meetup. And then afterwards, uh, we were talking as you do, and a guy said, oh, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Portland. And he said, oh, but where are you really from? <laughs> And so, you know, I did all this work convincing myself to go to the party, and then I was bummed <laughs> that I went. So that is the state uh, in which I went to this talk <laughs> to hear Isabel. Um, basically just kind of feeling like, eh, rad people, like, whatever. Um, I'm not saying this was an OH that I said, but I'm not not saying it. <laughs> um, so, um, so I, I went to this talk, and, um, and it was really impactful for me, and I, I want to share a few of the things that um, she talked about in that. And the first one is this. It takes courage and vulnerability to have empathy for other people. Empathy is not pity. It's not feeling bad or feeling sorry for someone. It is actually being willing to try to take on uh, what someone else is going through and figure out, you know, 
not what you would do uh, in their situation from your place of privilege, from your set of experiences, but how it feels for them to be going through whatever they're going through. And that is hard. It's a lot of work. And, um, and there's, there's kind of a limit to how much you can do it. Um, and really, we're, we're kind of better uh, at having empathy for animals than we are for people. This was a story about a 10-year-old boy who rescued a cat who was being tortured by some other boys and they you know, ran over it with his bicycle and, and all this stuff. And so in this story, in the comments, which you should never read, but um, in the comments, you know, the comments were all about how great the boy was who rescued the kitten and how awful the boys were who tortured the kitten. And what was not found in the comments uh, were comments wondering uh, what the cat had done to deserve it, uh, if the cat had asked for it, what the cat was wearing. Um, you know, <laughs> there weren't uh, comments blaming male hormones on the behavior of the torturers, and uh, no one accused the cat of playing the cat card and trying to make everything about cats. <laughs> <laughs> So I saw this movie. I feel like I'm probably the only person in this room who's seen this movie. It came out in 1982 when I was 11, and it was called White Dog. And the premise of this movie is that this dog had been literally trained to kill black people. And a black dog trainer takes this dog and tries to rehabilitate it. And um, I think, that I, for some reason, I couldn't tell you like a lot of the details of this movie. It already stuck in my head, though, um, probably because I really love dogs and I really love German Shepherds, um, and I was 11. Uh, but the point that I want to make is that if you encountered something like this, you know, yes, the dog is dangerous, and you're, you're not going to approach the dog, but you're probably going to understand that this dog has literally been tortured its whole life to make it feel how you know, to make it behave the way that it's behaving, um, and that context is important. And so you need to bring that context to the other humans that uh, you deal with every day. So um, if you're willing, I'd like you to participate in a little thought exercise with me. Um, uh, I will say that the more, the more axes of marginalization you experience in life, the, the, the more permission I give you to opt out of this. <laughs> um, but go ahead and close your eyes, um, if you choose, and just imagine for a moment that for hundreds of years, um, the people who look like you and the people who feel like you and the people who love like you had been enslaved and murdered and beaten down in every conceivable walk of life. Uh, imagine that you're not allowed to own a home even if you can afford one. Uh, imagine that your culture has all but been wiped out or stolen time and time again for others to profit on. Now I want you to think about someone that you love. And think about if that person left the house every day and you didn't know if they were going to come home. Think about if you had to worry that for no good reason that person might be just killed for going about their day. Think about if you had to worry about your son because... He works as a parking enforcement person, and you worry that someone's going to call the cops on him because they think he's stealing the cars. So go ahead and open your eyes. And now with that context in mind, uh, sometimes what happens is, you know, people come along, you know, well-meaning but possibly ignorant, and they say things like, I don't see color. Please remember, not everyone on this team is male. Bye, guys. That's so lame. 
Well, you're a writer, not technical. I know a lot of women tech writers. So, how do you feel about this as a woman? We love your talks, but we don't pay our speakers. Just stand on the stage and look pretty. So, sometimes when these things happen, although they seem small, you get this. You get this in response because you have ignited a powder keg that you didn't know existed because there are larger, there's a larger context that you weren't aware of or that you weren't thinking about. And, you know, a lot of times the reaction is like, hey, 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 why, why are you so angry? Like, what is the big deal? Chill out. And if you were nicer, you'd win more people over to your cause. You'd catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Like, you're still catching flies. I don't know why. I don't know why people <laughs> say that. Or if you just cooperate with the police, then you won't get hurt. This is from two days ago. And this man, uh, Charles Kinsey, uh, was trying to protect his patient. He had his hands up. He was on the ground. And when he asked the police officer why he shot him, the police officer said, said I, I don't know. So, you know, maybe if you will cooperate, you won't get hurt. Maybe if you're Kevin, that's true for you. Maybe if you're Kevin, the police will make every effort to subdue you, even if you are holding a gun, as this man is here, and you'll get the benefit of the doubt at every turn. So, having privilege is kind of like, uh, is kind of like having the latest version of Chrome, right? If you're Kevin, you are cruising the internet, you're cruising the high-speed internet on the latest of version of Chrome on your brand new 15-inch MacBook Pro. Everything is golden, okay? If you're me, maybe you are on IE7. You can still get the information, but it's, it's kind of a different experience. And, you know, if you're someone who's differently abled, trans, person of color, um, maybe you're cruising on IE6. Um, and a lot of times when you try to talk about your experience, what you get in reply is, hey, it works on my machine. <laughs> so, I want to thank Nicole for inspiring me to include this <laughs> slide at the last minute. I don't, I don't play Pokemon, but I did get to see it in action today. That was fun. So this isn't helpful or useful, um, and, it, and it, in fact, it's hurtful because, you know, as developers, there's a lot of developers in this room, I'm sure, who probably are experienced enough to have dealt with, like, all of the browsers that I mentioned. And you know, like, you know, you're working in the latest browser, you're coding up something beautiful, you're using all the, the latest, uh, you know, CSS tricks. Um, but you know that call is coming that's just like, oh, you know, your client who's like a, in a corporate legacy, you know, stuck on their old browser is going to be like, oh, it doesn't look right. And, and you don't say to them, well, it works on my machine, because like, you understand that that's, that's a real thing, they're having a different experience. And so you go and you try to fix it. So context. So some of the other things that um, Isabel talked about was about the importance of knowing your history, right? History provides context. Now, writing this book, she spent 15 years writing this book. She interviewed 1,200 people, and she chose three people to really focus on and be sort of her protagonists, her main characters that she follows through this entire journey. And she talked about the fact that she did that on purpose. She wanted to pick sort of like every, everyday people who are just kind of striving and trying to live the best life that they can. Because a lot of times, you know, when we talk about, you know, black people in society, we're talking about problems. We're talking about, you know, poverty or unemployment or black on black crime or, you know, and like she kind of compared it to the student who just comes in, 
and does their work and has really good attendance and pass the test and that that student gets ignored because they're not a problem so they don't they don't get attention so she wanted to focus the attention on these three people and she wanted her readers to experience what it was like for them to go on this journey and i think that's really important because the bottom line about empathy is that you can't have empathy unless you actually know and care about people on a personal level. The empathy is not in your head. You have to be, you have to get involved. And so without knowing the history, you get stuck in this cycle. And, you know, we all see this in tech, you know, discrimination and resistance and abuse and around and around and around again. And part of the part of the challenge of preparing this talk is going, you know, back to two year old slides and and realizing like, oh, I can just fill in, you know, this thing with the the current instance of whatever terrible thing is happening. Um, so one of the things I did when I first wrote this talk was I um, uh, Anita Sarkeesian is a, uh, a videographer and she, she writes videos, she releases videos about uh, women in video games and how women are portrayed in video games. And so I went into her Twitter mentions, uh, and this is where we get into uh, the uh, content warning. I went into her Twitter men mentions and I just screen capped some stuff that, uh, you know, this was just like probably in a day's worth of, of Twitter mentions. And these are some of the things that, you know, she was putting up with. And this is, this is in response to video game critique. And so as I was working on this, you know, kind of trying to see like what's the lay of the land, I, I went back to her mentions and this is from yesterday. And uh, this one in particular is, you know, wine stands for women who invent negative experiences. And one of the other problems about, you know, trying to speak up about abuse is just not being believed. And if you go to the Geek Feminism Wiki, uh, they have a timeline of incidents that starts in 1973. And I'm pretty sure if you peruse that, you would find a lot of repetition of the same kinds of incidents uh, happening over and over again. And, you know, the one positive thing about having that is that, you know, at least having that sort of record means, like, you you don't have to start the conversation at like negative 10. You don't have to start the conversation at, at, does this really happen? Which was a thing for a long time. For a long time it was like, oh, that's, that's not really happening. That's not really a problem. So at least we have the record of like, yes, this is really happening. But it all kinds of seems kind of inevitable. And so bringing this back to the tech world, um, you know, we've been talking about, I think, tech companies, big tech companies kind of started to release their numbers a couple of years ago and, and have been talking this big talk about diversity, and yet a lot of teams still look like this. Um, and I am really heartened to say that this is my original slide from probably two or more years ago, and that I'm hopeful that this team looks different based on some things that I've heard in the last eight hours. Um, but, you know, that kind of team is not sustainable, and, uh, and you know, GitHub knows that. GitHub's obviously working really, really hard to change that kind of scenario. But the reality in the U.S. is that 75% of white Americans have no friends, not even acquaintances, who are people of color. Zero. So if you can only have empathy if you know and, and you know, have affinity for someone, and 75% of white people know zero people of color, what are the implications for, you know, the future of us getting along as a society? And one of the things that happens when you start talking about these things is that companies will say, <laughs> Facebook, 
Um, <laughs> it's a pipeline problem. There's just not enough, there's not enough people. Really. There's a lot of organizations who have been working really hard to try to give opportunity to underrepresented people in tech uh, in spaces where they can actually do their best work. So the pipeline is not the problem. Um, you know, people of color, underrepresented people are graduating from these schools and programs and from, you know, and getting computer science degrees and fully half of them are not getting hired. So it's not the pipeline problem. And another thing that people like to say is, well, if you don't like it, why don't you go build your own? Right? It's like, oh, you know, I know that we, um, we basically built this country like off the backs of your labor and we stole your land and uh, you know, you've been marginalized and denied the opportunity to build wealth, but why don't you just go build your own thing? And amazingly, sometimes, <laughs> We do. Anyway, even though it's really, really hard to get resources. You know, I saw a little bit of how hard it was just to get this live captioning, you know, and I've, I've had my own struggle with like trying to raise funds for things and I watch people in our communities try to get access to resources to try to make things, things better and it is, it's a struggle. But sometimes we just, you know, get fed up and we go off and we make our own thing. And that's kind of cool, but you know what bugs me about that? It kind of seems like we did that already, right? And, you know, in some ways, it kind of was better in certain aspects when schools were segregated. I mean, you had if you had all black students and all black teachers, then those teachers at least believed in those students and encouraged those students as opposed to having, you know, uh, I don't remember how Nicole talked about it, but like having the difference where you're just the one and people are already sort of putting their, their low expectations on you and shoving you in a corner and putting, you know, putting you onto the slow track. But the problem with that is that, you know, having access, everybody should have access to all the opportunities that they want. So, I have some good news. The good news is that we've made it through all the super bummer parts of this talk. <laughs> and I wanna talk to you about what do, we, what do we do? How do we start to fix this? How do we make it a little bit better? And the first thing is to, to understand that we are all living in our own personal bubble, and it's a bubble made up of our particular um, experiences and our particular identities uh, and intersections. And we live and interact with people who are also in their own bubbles. But you have to, you have to understand that that's happening so that you can at least realize like, okay, I'm coming at this from my particular perspective. Let me try to listen and understand someone else's perspective. And the second thing is that we need to understand that we're gonna screw up as we start to widen our circle and interact with people who are different than ourselves and people who have experiences that we know nothing about, we're gonna screw up. And we might get called out on that, and that's okay. You will actually survive <laughs> someone telling you that you screwed up and did something hurtful. And um, I think we don't see enough examples of that happening where it happens, and then we, you know, apologize and we move on for it. And I'll tell you a story. When, um, when I was in college the first time, which was many, many years ago, uh, it was at the University of Oregon, and I did, at that time, there were, I think, 18,000 students, and there were 50 black students on campus. And um, so they did a video series, like, you know, sort of talking about diversity and interviewing a lot of the students of color. So I was being interviewed by uh, a, Native, a Native American woman on camera, on video, and she asked me some question, and I said, something, something low on the totem pole. And 
we, we were, had a pretty friendly relationship, so in response to that, she just kicked me under the table. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that, that was not good. And it was recorded, and maybe, maybe they'll edit it out if they're feeling kind. Um, but, you know, I said it. She kicked me. I was like, yeah, that was not good. <laughs> and I apologized, and we moved on. And, you know, you need to be able to accept those criticisms, because what's actually happening when someone tells you, like, hey, you screwed up and you said this thing or you did this thing that's really hurtful, is that that person is saying to you, I think you're better than this. And they're giving you a chance to be better, to live up to their expectations. And no matter how safe a person seems, it's always incredibly, it's incredible emotional risk, and it takes a ton of energy to even say anything in the first place. Even if you are 99.9% .9 certain that the reaction is gonna be something, you know, that, that you want, that the person's gonna apologize. It still takes a ton of energy um, to actually do that. So when you respond with defensiveness and retreat into you know, trying to defend yourself and trying to prove that you're a good person. You know, we all want to be good people and we, we have this idea of ourselves as, as nice people. Um, then you're actually furthering the injury by basically derailing and denying what happened. And I want to just say a little bit about being nice because nice people are kind of dangerous. I, I really don't... <laughs> I'm really kind of mistrustful of nice people, and there's a study talking about how, you know, nice people can be so conflict averse that in this experiment, they, they were given orders to, you know, they, they weren't really shocking these people, but they, they didn't know that. And so they would just continue to take orders to do harm to someone because they didn't want to have conflict. So I don't really trust or like niceness, and I would suggest and encourage you to be kind instead of, or at least in addition to, being nice. So I want to just talk about what, what do you do? Um, does anybody remember, did anybody do this like in school where they tell you what to do if there's a fire? What do you do if there's a fire? Stop, drop, and roll. Good job. So, <laughs> so In order to kind of counteract this sort of visceral emotional response of like wanting to, to defend yourself and having flight, or, f flight or, or fight, you need an alternative plan, right? So if someone calls you out on something that you've said or done, um, here is your three-step plan. Uh, the first thing is to stop. Like don't, like take a minute, take a breath. Before you respond, just, just stop and, and take in what, ever feedback that you have been given. And the second step is to listen. Like to really try to turn off whatever's going on in your head and listen to what the person is telling you, listen to their point of view. And then the third step is just to apologize. And There's a link uh, to a really great article about um, a teacher and how she teaches her students to, to really apologize and they role play it and um, it's awesome and I'll post it up later. Um, but if you do these things, the great thing is, is by and large, most of the time, you can probably go on with your day. Like when people dig in and they double down and they get defenses, then it becomes this huge thing and it's back and forth and like you can't even, whatever it is you were trying to accomplish with that person gets completely derailed. Whereas if you can just sort of take in the feedback and apologize, then you can move on. And we don't, you know, we don't see enough of that. Um, we don't see that demonstrated. And Paul, you know, did a great thing here where he just kind of was like, oh, oops. Thanks for letting me know that. All right. And then the other thing that you need to do is, you know, we talked about, I talked about how insular people can be with their circles. You know, we get, we get into a zone where we're just 
interacting with people like us, other developers, other designers, you know. Um, you need to like get out of your comfort zone. <laughs> Branch out a little bit. Um, start to learn and give a shit about people who are not like you. And you know, if you live in a place that's super homogenous, guess what? I'm gonna assume because you're all here, you all have access to the internet, which means you literally have access to most of the world um, and a lot of the world's information and a lot of perspectives from people who are freely putting out information about you know, what it's like to be them. So, you know, there are a ton of resources. Like, don't, don't go out and try to make friends with people, like, so you can, like, check off your diversity box, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but, you know, start to follow some different people on Twitter. And pro tip, marginalized people on Twitter don't only talk about being marginalized. We talk about a ton of stuff. So, you know, uh, when you're following somebody, you're going to, most likely find some other thing that you're like, oh, hey, I like to nerd out about Pokemon or, you know, whatever it is. And talk to them about that. Like, talk to people as people, but get to know some different kinds of people and find out, you know, what's important to them and what kinds of day-to-day -day things go on in their lives. Um, read a book. I highly recommend. Uh, I highly recommend getting Warmth of Other Suns, full disclosure. Um, I bought it on Wednesday, and I'm 22 pages in. Um, but she actually said in the talk that she felt like if you read that book, that that was probably the closest as a white person you would get to understanding like what it's like to be black and to go through that journey. So like we have all this information. You just have to do a little bit of work and a little bit of searching um, and, and, you know, expend some effort to go and find this information and go and connect with other people. Spend 30 minutes a day just, like, replacing your Twitter with a list that is, like, not all your normal people. And I, I made this list. This list is, like, three years old. It's still up. So if you don't, if you're like, oh, I don't know anybody, like, go, go to this list and just follow it. What would our spaces look like? I love that Nicole talked about this. Like, if we could have empathy as a core value in our workspaces, people could do amazing work. People would be freed up to do amazing work. And, you know, if you talk to, you know, I love that she would go and interview, like, give me your, your black engineers and talk to them because there's always... There's always the mental overhead of doing that second job, of doing your job, and then doing your job of being the, the blank, the gay, you know, the gay piplup, or <laughs> the black developer. You know, that's like a whole other job. So, you know, what if we created these spaces where people could do their best work? Um, and sometimes that looks like really just like small things, like your language, which isn't really a small thing. But it's, it's an easy thing. Comparably, it's a really easy thing to change um, and make, make people an esteemed part of your projects and your communities and your workplaces. So I want to encourage you not to be an ally, but to be an accomplice and to, uh, to really listen to other people's stories, one of the most powerful things you can do on whatever axes of privilege that you have is to listen to other people's stories and to witness those, bear witness to those, and to share those stories. Um, share what you learn. Because one of the things that happened is that, you know, when you're talking about being harmed as a marginalized person, often we're just not believed. So when people, you know, with higher ranks of privilege talk about it, like suddenly, Suddenly it's a thing. So if you have the power to do that, if you have the privilege to do that, it's a really powerful thing for you to do. And then speak up for others as you are able. And just know that as you do this work, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to screw up. Um, but that is the job. 
This is my pinned tweet, by the way, so if you wanna. Um, and it ha what are we up to? 1,200 retweets, I don't know, people love this tweet, but that, that's the job, like, do the best you can, apologize if you screw up, learn from your mistakes. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.